Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research Show. Hey, everyone. I wanted to give you a quick rundown of the format of the following video to make sure you can get the most value out of the video uh, as you can. So here's the format and the breakdown. The first thing Dr. Evans and I are going to go over is just an overview of the research. We're going to look at just what the research said, what it concluded, um, and some highlights of that. Next, we're going to get into the nitty gritty, a deep dive into the research. We're going to go through every single section, all the, the little details that a lot of people don't know about. But for those people that want to read research but don't have the time or don't want to sit down and just kind of grind through that research, they can listen to this or watch this and they can, they can follow that research for the most part uh, to go along and to really understand in depth what the research did. After that, Dr. Evans and I are going to go through just some discussion on how the research relates to, uh, to patients, to doctors, and, and what, uh, you know, what the authors are doing in, in the future and, and, and right now as far as research and, and just kind of give more value for the research and give more context for that. So fast forward through to wherever you want to go, to whatever parts you want to see, uh, and please give a comment uh, down below in regards to was this valuable? What would you like more of? Any questions? Uh, anything at all? And support us if you can. Uh, we appreciate it. We're trying to bring you value, and we want to uh, do that as much as possible. Uh, enjoy. Dr. Tyler Evans, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, Dr. Kevin Leach. How are you? Awesome, awesome. So let's get right into it. So this paper is a case control study of cerebellar tonsillar ectopia, Chiari, and head neck trauma whiplash. It is by Michael Freeman, Scott Rosa, David Harshfield, Francis Smith, Robert Bennett, and Christopher Centeno et al. So and this was published in the journal Brain Injury. So before we get into the deep dive of the paper, uh, Dr. Evans, will you just kind of give a general overview of what the paper is saying? What were they looking for? Results, conclusions, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's important for people to get a 30,000 foot view before we dive in. And there are a lot of statistics with this paper. There's a lot going on, uh, but there's some really great takeaways. So we want to make sure that you come away with these. Um, so this paper um, was done to study, the primary objective was done to study Chiari mal malformations and herniations of the, the cerebellar tonsils through the frame and magnum. Um, that's also known as CTE, uh, not to be confused with uh, uh, the football CTE. Uh, they're different types of, of brain injury. Um, but uh, the point here is that they were the, the symptomatic um, problems people were experiencing, they were trying to study based on MRIs what they were seeing and how people responded in terms of symptoms. So when we do a cervical MRI, most of the time we lay people flat and the cervical MRI scans for 1200 neck pain patients were reviewed, um, but some of them were done upright. So 600 trauma cases, so people with trauma um, to the neck, uh, and 600 non-trauma, so they were the control, so they had no trauma to their neck. Half of the groups were scanned in a flat or recumbent position, and half were scanned in an upright uh, position. And there were two radiologists that reviewed the scans uh, for cerebellar tonsils. And so we'll go into you know, what cerebellar tonsils are and, and all the details there, but um, so basically, the outcomes and results were that there was a total of 1,195 of 1,200 scans were read. So there were five that just, just uh, didn't get read for whatever reason. Um, and CTE, cerebellar tonsillar ectopia, was found in 5.7% and 5.3% in the recumbent and upright non-trauma groups versus 9.8% um, and 23.3% in the recumbent and upright trauma groups. So trauma versus, sorry, sorry non-trauma versus trauma, there was an increase, a spike in 
how many people had CTE. That is a huge finding because they've never shown that before in a paper ever. So that's, that's point one. Um, the results described in this pres uh, present investigation are first to demonstrate a neuroradiographic difference between neck pain patients with and without a recent his history of whiplash trauma. The results of prior research on uh, these problems uh, were confounded because of a failure to account for possible uh, basically neuropathology. So this was a big paper in that uh, they, they had this really interesting finding at the end between trauma and non-trauma and the upright um, and the recumbent scanning groups. All right, sounds good. That's a good overview. Um, any last takeaways for patients, providers, chiropractors, um, for this for this type of research, just kind of a, you know, how is this valuable, and what kind of person could could really benefit from this evidence? Yeah. So so number one, I mean, I think it's uh, very pertinent for anyone who has been diagnosed with Chiari malformation. It helps you understand the diagnosis a little bit better. Uh, but there's a lot about that, and we can get into that later. But um, you know, for people who have Chiari or for people who have had car accidents, especially car accidents and whiplash trauma, uh, that if you're going to be getting a scan of your cervical spine or of your brain to make sure that it is in an upright position, if you can find one close to you and afford it, um, they're roughly about $600 for a scan. But uh, if you can find an upright scan, they're going to generally speaking, based on what this paper shows, find more of the uh, pathology should show up radiographically speaking uh, in their imaging. And, and you may get a different diagnosis because of that. So it's really important if you've had an injury to your head or neck um, to be doing upright imaging because it shows the problem in gravity, which we're walking around in gravity all day long. And if you get a scan when you're laying down on your, on your back, that problem may not show up nearly as much because gravity is not in play like it would be most of the time in your life. Um, you know, most patients' symptoms go away when they lay down. You know, their headaches get better or their back pain gets better. And so we see that when we sit people up, gravity actually affects this stuff. Um, so this paper is the first paper to actually show that. That's very important. Let's review the terminology and what they mean. Chiari malformation is the same as cerebellar tonsillar ectopia, which is two different words for the same thing. This is where the cerebellar tonsils, meaning the lower part of the back of your brain, are actually sticking out of your head at the bottom of your head into the spinal canal where the head meets the neck. Chiari type one malformation is what this paper will be looking into. Type 1 may be associated with syringomyelia, which is a cyst or a cavity inside the spinal cord, and bone abnormalities, uh, but can happen in the absence of both of those. Chiari type 2, or Arnold Chiari malformation, is a tonsillar ectopia present at birth and nearly always associated with myelomeningocele, which is spina bifida. The following are the symptoms mostly associated with type 1s, type 1 Chiari malformation. Occipital headaches, neck pain, upper extremity numbness and paresthesia, which is tingling or pins and needles, and weakness and lower extremity weakness and signs of cerebellar dysfunction. Diagnosis for Chiari type 1 malformations is mostly done with MRI. There are different definitions based on different authors of research, but they measure how far descended down into the spinal canal the cerebellar tonsils go, below the foramen magnum, which is at the opening at the bottom of the head where the brainstem turns into the spinal cord. Some define it as two millimeters, some even define it as five millimeters below the imaginary line at the foramen magnum called the Bayesian epistheon line which is drawn from the front to the back of the frame and magnum. The diagnosis comes with or without symptoms present in the patient. This paper is to investigate the question of whether trauma 
like a whiplash can create this condition and what the mechanism and results might be as suggested by previous authors. Some suggest it might be that Chiari was there prior to the trauma and that the trauma made these patients symptomatic. Answering the question of whether cerebellar tonsillar ectopia are potentially created by trauma is difficult as most non-traumatic patients do not have MRIs to see if ectopia or ectopia is present. This study is a case-controlled study. It is designed to compare traumatic and non-traumatic patients with neck pain for prevalence of CTE, cerebellar tonsillar ectopia. Not only prevalence between trauma and non-trauma, car accident and, and non-car accident, but between MRIs taken standing and laying down to see if the effect of gravity has a change in, in the diagnosis. On to the methods. MRI images were taken of the neck and base of the skull of 1,200 consecutive neck pain patients, 15 years old or over, at four different radiology centers over a three-year period. 600 traumatic car crashes, 600 non-traumatic. Half of the traumatic and half of the non-traumatic were each scanned upright and the other half sitting. So there are, so there are four groups of 300. 300 upright traumatic, 300 laying down, 300 upright non-traumatic, and 300 laying down non-traumatic. The Institutional Review Board approval was from the Spinal Injury Foundation. Sagittal sequences for the MRI, meaning which slices they looked at, were taken at the area where the cerebellar tonsils were at their lowest point compared to the Bayesian epistheon line, or foramen magnum. Films were read by two authors that are board-certified radiologists and that were blinded in regards to which patients were traumatic and non-traumatic, so there was no bias there, and positioned seated or standing. When the two radiologists disagreed, the measurement that was more conservative, more cephalid, was taken, meaning more, more higher, because we were looking to see which is lower. I'm going to go over some definitions and some of the statistical analyses that they did in the paper for those interested to try to make it a little bit more clear. So one of the things that they did is called a three-way analysis of variance. It's called ANOVA. It's, it's an acronym, A-N-O-V-A. This means there were three factors involved in the analysis, first one being trauma, non-trauma, second being seated versus laying down, which is upright and recumbent, and the last one was male-female, with the variable being measured as ectopia or descending of the tonsils below the foramen magnum. So they were looking at that in all of these different situations. They also did what's called a Tukey pairwise comparison now that's carried out only if there is a significant finding between initial variables analyzed, meaning if they found that there was no difference in tonsillar level comparing all three variables, there'd be no reason to look further. But they saw a difference, so they did a Tukey pairwise comparison. Tukey test is used when to compare three or more variables to determine whether the interactions are statistically significant. So the ANOVA, or the analysis of variance, tells you whether there is a significance in the variables, but it won't tell you which were significant. Meaning there was an interaction between some of the variables, yes. Which variables were significant will tell you which ones interacting are significant. And that's what the Tukey pairwise comparison does. Which of the variables were significant when compared to each other. There's also what's called a chi-square goodness of fit test. This is a formula in statistics that compares different groups of variables to see how much of a relationship they have. A very low number indicates a strong association. A high number indicates a weak association. And the chi-square variable in the study was around 0 0.0001. It was very, very slow. So the lower number indicated a higher, stronger association. 
the p value, the significance level uh, represented by the Greek letter alpha is 0 0.05. P value on the study represents whether the variable being analyzed is significant or not. If P is less than or equal to 0 0.00, I'm sorry, 0 0.05, there is significance. If it's greater than 0 0.05, it is not. The kappa range for agreement between the two radiologists was between 0.85 and 0.95. The kappa range in statistics is one of the most commonly used inter-examiner or inter-rater inter reliability. 0.81 to 1 is considered almost perfect agreement. A 0 to a negative 1 is considered no agreement at all. And this study had 0.85 to 0.95, which is high agreement. A 95% confidence interval. This is an interval or range that contains the average measurement 95% of the time. The common misconception of the 95% confidence interval is that 95% of the measurements fall within this given, this given range, but this is false. What this means is that there's a 95% chance that a ran, random sample of data, meaning if we took the group of 300 and we took 10 of those data points and we created an average, an average range there, then 95% of the time, the average of the samples, of all the samples, will fall within that range. Uh, the more narrow the confidence interval, the more confident we can be with our average. The wider the interval, the less accurate. So if you only take two samples from a 300 uh, sample um, population, then the interval is going to be very wide and it's not going to be very, very accurate. But if you take the more samples you take, the more closer to the average you're going to be. So instead of the standard deviation, which tells you the average of the values outside of the average, so it's like a range, it gives you a range, your measurements values are 95% likely to fall into. 95% as opposed to 90 or 99. It's, so 95% confidence interval is the value agreed upon by researchers that gives the most useful information. Um, this 95% confidence interval or just confidence interval in general is quite, uh, is quite a confusing uh, statistic and an analysis. Uh, if, if, if anyone wants more further explanation, leave that in the comments uh, below and we'll try to go through that a little bit more for more understanding. Okay, let's get into the results of the study. So five of the 1,200 scans were determined unreadable for whatever reason. Um, the agreement between the two radiologists uh, using what is called a kappa range was between 0.85 and 0.95, which is in the almost perfect range. So they're just comparing in the study. When the radiologist read the studies without the others presence, did they agree? And for the most part, they did. It was, again, almost perfect. Um, both injury status, meaning trauma and non-trauma, and scan type, meaning upright and recumbent, were found to be st st statistically significant with p-value being equal or less than 0 0.0001 which just means that statistically speaking, the, the end result of those measurements is significant. It's not just coincidence, it's not the same. There's a significant difference, meaning there, there's, there's something to be looked at there. The uh, highest to lowest uh, tonsillar level uh, for, was, was what you would actually expect. And so non-trauma laying down, again, without gravity, the average, uh, the average height was 2.2 millimeters above the foramen magnum, the bottom of the skull, the area that, uh, that, that was measured, um, and that is measured for the Chiari malformation. The next uh, lowest level would be the non-trauma upright, so that's in gravity, so we would expect things to settle down a little bit more to be closer to the, uh, to the, to the bottom of the skull where the brain, com brain comes out. And that was at 1.7 millimeters above the, uh, the foramen magnum. 
And then uh, the third would be the traumatic laying down, again, without gravity, but still had the trauma. And that's at 1.3 millimeters above the frame and magnum. And then obviously uh, the worst one being the traumatic upright with gravity, which is what we would expect. And that was at uh, 0.1 millimeters. Um, one of the things that they used and one of the, the, uh, the methods they used in the results to compare all of these was a was is called a Tukey pairwise comparison, um, and that showed that the trauma uh, patients were st statistically significant lower levels uh, of the tonsils for both the recumbent and the upright uh, compared to non-trauma. So again, another another comparison, another method to show a statistical significance. Um, there was a significant uh, difference between male and females that they found as well. And um, the tonsillar herniation of five millimeters or more was rare and only found in six of the 11, you know, 1195 scans that were read. Um, the group was also analyzed to see the percentage of patients with tonsils with one millimeter or more below that frame and magnum. And then and the results, which is what Dr. Ta Dr. Evans just, just mentioned, um, the non-traumatic recumbent was 5.7, non-traumatic upright 5.3. And then when those are compared to the trauma, recumbent trauma upright, we got 9.3 and then 23.3. So that against significant changes going from the non-trauma to the trauma, uh, statistically significant. Um, when looking at the male versus female, the percentage points was about maybe one to two more for females compared to the males. And that's in, in table two in the research if anyone's actually looking at the research right now. So in the discussion section, uh, the study reports that patients with a history of motor vehicle crash associated neck pain have substantially higher frequency of CTE. Again, CTE is cerebellar tonsillar ectopia. Um, that more than the, the non-traumatic patients by almost uh, two times and then four times when scanned in the recumbent position compared to the non-trauma. Um, this is the first large series and study like this of patients to be evaluated for this CTE. So it's pretty groundbreaking. Obviously, more studies need to be done, uh, but it's, it's showing some pretty, pretty strong evidence for uh, trauma being related to CTE um, in the upright position uh, compared to a scan in the recumbent position. Uh, comparison, uh, so the average level of the tonsils and the frequency of the CTE uh, again, obviously, with the trauma groups, it was found to be more. Um, this suggests a reasonable conclusion that the results reflect a degree of gravity-dependent instability in the trauma group. Uh, we're going to get into the different mechanisms of how that could be, which I found interesting uh, from reading the study. A potential source of bias or a variable could be that the images were taken at four different imaging facilities. So in the research, they want to see what variables could be affecting it. So there were two recumbent and two upright. That could be a variable. Uh, it's been suggested that being in an upright position will cause the tonsils to herniate caudally due to gravity alone. And so this this research was trying to figure out if gravity, um, if gravity alone was a factor comparing the non-trauma and the trauma, and we see that there was definitely a difference there. Uh, this makes sense from a mechanical and gravitational standpoint. Ideally, all patients would have been scanned recumbent and upright to see the shift uh, with potential change. Um, that could be a future study uh, to look at that as well. Um, these findings bring up a question whether the CTE was present before the trauma and was awakened by the trauma, or if the trauma caused the CTE. Uh, evidence suggests the latter, as the occurrence of the CTE was substantially greater in the trauma group, uh, upright versus recumbent, and then the non-trauma upright versus recumbent group, suggesting instability when gravity is involved. One hypothetical mechanism of lower tonsils in the traumatic group is a dural leak due to trauma. So there's been some past research that has shown lower tonsils 
after lumbar shunting of CSF in cases of hydrocephalus. There's clinical evidence that whiplash traumas cause dural leaks, especially in the lumbar spine at the dural sleeves. Um, and this is actually measured if somebody were to actually be looking into getting this tested, radioisotope cisternography would be, would be used, uh, which is a specific exam to, to test spinal fluid leaks. Uh, the study shows that uh, whether the CTE observed in the trauma group was from crash trauma or pre-existing, the evidence shows CTE is more prevalent in neck pain patients with trauma compared to non-trauma. Some limitations for the study, uh, lack of detail in the differentiation of trauma and non-trauma regarding recent history of whiplash. Uh, it's reasonable, reasonable to believe that some of the patients in the non-trauma groups have had a past trauma but not recent enough to be included in the trauma group, meaning it's, we, they don't know that the non-trauma group never had a whiplash injury, so that could be a variable uh, in the exam, meaning maybe those patients healed over time, so they're not in, so they're not in the 9 point, the 9, uh, the 9 percent or the 23 percent showing the instability when in an upright position. Second limitation, a lack of detailed information regarding symptoms of the subject. Uh, symptom, uh, symptom headaches and neck pain are similar in the Chiari following uh, head and neck trauma and symptoms following whiplash. So those are similar, they overlap. Uh, and so a detailed, more detailed exam for those patients would, would help differentiate as well. Uh, other research has shown association of CTE with fibromyalgia. Uh, so the current paper may create an appealing hypothesis that links fibromyalgia to whiplash by way of acquired CTE. So there's a lot of overlap. And in research, we talk about association doesn't mean causation, things like that. So there's just some interesting things to think about there. A future study that would be good next step would be a study that performed a detailed neurological examination and elicited pre and post injury history uh, of Chiari unique uh, headache symptoms. Uh, for example, cough exacerbations, as well as recumbent and, and, and upright MRI assessment of CTE. As far as the conclusion section, uh, the research is the first, again, to demonstrate a substantial neuro, neuroradiographic difference between neck pain patients with and without a recent history of motor vehicle crash trauma. CTE is found 2.5 times more in upright compared to recumbent MRI. Future research should seek to confirm results found in this study. Also helpful would be biomechanical research to show mechanisms during whiplash that could cause dural injury. And clinicians and patients should consider evaluating patients uh, to C for CTE with upright MRI of head and neck if persistent occipital headaches occur and, and, and symptoms do occur. Let's get into our view on, on the paper. Well, Kevin, the strengths of this study are that it really is the first paper to ever show this relationship. Um, it was done by a handful of guys that um, had been working together using uh, what's called Phonar Upright MRI. And a man by the name of Raymond Demadian. Uh, he's actually, this is to be debated, but um, he is the developer of the MRI machine back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, I think somewhere in there, um, you know, thinking ahead, thinking about trauma and injuries and how better to, uh, you know, help people find a diagnosis and help people find a, a treatment for whatever problem they might be facing. And so uh, all these guys kind of started to use this technology, the Phonar Upright MRI, uh, Scott Rosa being one of them. He's a mentor of ours. That's how I found out about this paper. But, um, you know, they have done some amazing things with this upright MRI technology. And uh, this study of the tonsils and how that affects the fluid flow, the cerebrospinal fluid. And, you know, we could go into rabbit holes on every single one of thing, these things and do an hour long talk on cerebrospinal fluid flow, Chiari malformation, you know, all the different types. I think there's like 
depending on who you talk to, there's three or four or five different types of Chiari malformation, um, depending on who you talk to. But you know, this this paper was kind of a an unlocking of that information into into PubMed and into the world, and uh, was a first step in a really a really great direction. Um, and so, you know, just just remembering that 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 uh, trauma uh, definitely in this paper showed a a um, a I don't want to say causation or uh, even a correlation, but an association, association, right? An association between the data um, that they found on these tra trauma patients that lower C, uh, tonsils. But a couple of things that um, are really neat about this uh, is that in this paper, they defined any, any Chiari as um, below the, the Bayesian Apistian line, the front of the skull uh, or the front of the frame and magnum and the back of the frame and magnum. And, uh, and that line, anything below that by one or two, was it one millimeter? I think it was one. One millimeter. When in, in um, some previous papers, it's been defined as five, right? And so that's, that's significant because, you know, I see a lot of patients, and you probably have too, Kevin, where people come in and they've got these, these tonsils that are five millimeters below their frame and magnum. That's a lot for your brain to be herniated down. Yep below the skull, right? Obviously there's gonna be a problem, but at one millimeter, what's happening at one mil millimeter? Or what's happening at zero when it's at the frame and magnum, but not below it, right? So we call that actually a Chiari zero. Um, and you can look it up the Mayfield Clinic, um, mayfieldclinic.com or so, something to that effect. Um, they have uh, a whole description on Chiari zero and, and some of the explanations on each of the different Chiaris. Uh, and some believe that it comes from trauma, and some believe that it comes from a genetic component when you're born. I think from my experience, I've found that it's probably a little bit of both, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of research to be done here. Um, and, and a lot of these patients, they just get told, well, you have Chiari, and there's not a lot we can do about it. Or they do the surgery, and the surgery is... Um, it's aggressive, right? And so, you know, that goes, that's a whole nother talk that we can go into later. We can do a paper. I've got, you know, this paper I just pulled up here does a whole covering of Chiari malformation. It's called Malformations of the Craniocervical Junction, Chiari Type 1, and Syringomyelia uh, Classification, Diagnosis, and Treatment. That was done in 2009. At some point, we can go into that paper. Okay. But you get my point is that these patients, they struggle with headaches, dizziness, you know, vestibular problems, eye problems, uh, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, um, uh, problems piecing sentences together, you know, like memory retention, brain fog, they have all of this, this what we call craniocervical syndrome, and that's not in this paper, but uh, in this book that came out later on, this book here, we say right. the title and uh, yeah, the title is the craniocervical syndrome and MRI, and it was actually written um, and error. The editors were Francis Smith, one of the uh, uh, authors of this paper, who is a radiologist in Scotland, I believe, um, Aberdeen, uh, I believe is where it was from. But uh, Francis Smith and Jay Dworkin, all these, a lot of these guys that were in this this paper that we're talking about, they actually put a lot of research into this book. And that book talks even more about, uh, you know, CTE and cerebrospinal fluid problems and, um, and the Chiari issues. So, you know, there's a, a whole new science that's emerging here is what I'm trying to get at. And this paper was the first step into that world. Um, so, I don't know, Kevin, uh, do you have, do you have anything that you want to, you want to swing? I was going to ask you the EM, is it EMP therapy or do you know anything about uh, when they find a dural leak yeah. and they do something where they put some coagulating agents to try to stop the leak and they say some research shows that that gives an immediate uh, relief. How do yeah, it's, it's called how a blood we, patch. How do we usually. figure out if those patients are in need of that and if they need that isotope cisternography or like how does that therapy or that 
fix, because it seems like it's actually a fixing of the cause of the problem. How, how does, what do you know about that? Well, honestly, I can't say a whole lot. I know that a blood patch is one of the things that they do. Um, they take your blood and they put it back into where the hole around the dura would be. And what that does is your platelets and your, your blood then uh, kind of fills that gap and closes that gap. But it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's painful when you have a fluid leak like that. A lot of, um, a lot of mothers actually, and that's what, what I've experienced in my, my time as a, as a chiropractor is that a lot of mothers get uh, dural leaks when they get injections, right? For um, uh, uh, and, uh, epidurals, right? And, right? and so when the needle goes in, sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't sit just right and uh, it can actually tear the dural sac. And then you've got this whole another problem of fluid imbalance in the skull and you'll, you'll get a massive migraine um, until they patch it basically and and oftentimes ladies don't recover from that very quickly if at all um, and and so that's that's something that I have seen and it the cisternography is imaging of the uh, cisterns there's four of them I believe in the skull um, and they basically are what houses the CSF uh, the cerebrospinal fluid. So for everybody out there, if you're, you're listening, cerebrospinal fluid is the fluid that go, bathes your brain, lays on your brain in between the blood-brain barrier and your brain. And it's what pulls away toxins and brings nutrients to the brain. It also protects the brain uh, as a fluid layer. It's what kind of holds your brain up inside of the skull um, and protects it from the, the hard outside. Um, and so that, that fluid, um, you know, is really important to have the right balance and have the proper flow around the brain. It starts deep inside the brain. It's made deep inside the brain, and then it pumps out, and then it flows down and around the skull and goes down through the spine, and then it pumps back up via heart, heart rate, so heartbeat, and lung respiration, as well as movement. And so as that CSF flows around, it does its job. But what can happen is that if you have this Chiari problem, it can literally be a cork in the bottle in the base of the skull right. and plug that fluid up. And then, you know, that can be an issue. So that's something that we see a lot of, a lot of patients for. And, and a lot of the research that came out of this paper points to more of that Chiari uh, problem with CSF flow. Right. Yeah, I said EMP. I meant EBP, so that's epidural blood patch, just like you said. Oh, yeah, there you go. To, yeah. to correct that. So yeah. I feel like you're saying that when patients have that, their their symptoms might be a little bit more severe, like yeah. the typical runny fluid out of the nose, runny fluid out of the ear, um, pain, headache relief by laying down. Those are, those typically go, they get caught. They don't really go un, undetected. Is that? Is that fair to say the ones that really that need the EB EBP? Oh. Do you feel like they might go undetected, and that they just need that fix, and that would actually help them significantly? Yeah, um, yeah. If you have running fluid out of your ear or your nose, you're going to be in trouble. Definitely red flag. Either way, yeah, yeah. Like that's yeah. So, anyways, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, some other uh, some other talking points. Um, will you go over uh, the uh, cranial cervical syndrome? Oh yeah. And how that relates to uh, you know this research? Yeah. So um, just these doctors that uh, that wrote this paper. So the lead author is always the first guy on the paper. So Michael Freeman. He was the lead author. Um, he is a medical forensic scientist, and he deals a lot with traumatology and uh, whiplash and, and um, injuries, right? And so this, I mean, we can circle back around to your comment about gravity, weight bearing, and possible damage to the upper neck and, and how that relates. But this is craniocervical syndrome. All these guys are in this world of craniocervical instability slash craniocervical syndrome and how they relate. So Freeman is a medical doctor. Actually, Scott Rosa is the only chiropractor on this page. He, he was the only 
uh, upper cervical. He is an upper cervical chiropractor and atlas orthogonal upper cervical chiropractor. Um, and he was the second guy on the paper. So he, he definitely had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of input on the paper. Um, and David Harshfield, he uh, was, is a radiologist uh, down south. I can't remember exactly where, but uh, uh, he also looks at craniocervical instability and does, he does some uh, regenerative, regenerative therapies like injections. Uh, not sure if it's pro-low or PRP. I think he does a little bit of both maybe, um, uh, but you'd have to look it up. Uh, but David Harshfield is a, uh, you know, he's a well-known radiologist uh, that works with Scott Rosa. Um, and then we have Francis Smith. He's a, another radiologist. Uh, Dr. Bennett, I don't actually know who that is, um, but I do know Christopher Centeno. Um, I met him at the, uh, the symposium we had last June, uh, and he does regenerative therapies as well. He uses m digital motion x-ray uh, to see ligaments uh, that might be either torn or damaged in movement in the neck. So they do flexion extension uh, movement with the neck and uh, they look to see how the ligaments might be torn or, torn or damaged as well as that upright MRI. So they use all these technologies to image the craniocervical junction, meaning cranial skull, cervical neck junction is right in between the two. And that's a black hole for the, for the really the health community. These guys are the first guys to really get in there and look at it. So <clears throat> what they're doing is they're looking at what ligaments might be damaged and injured. Possibly there, there's, there's, a, there's a minimum of seven to nine ligaments in just right up here. It's seven to nine lig ligaments between the craniocervical junction being the apical ligament that attaches from C2 up to the skull, uh, the alar ligaments, which are cross check ligaments that check lateral bending and rotation in movement. Um, and so they keep your, basically they keep your atlas attached to your skull in these movements. And what we find is that sometimes these ligaments are completely blown in some of these whiplash injuries, head, head and neck trauma injuries. And so when they go and dip their head or they tip side to side, the bone just goes whoop, like way off to one side. And so that's what we're talking about. And what, what happens then when you have instability in, the, in that craniocervical junction, that's where your brainstem is. And that's the, that's the tonsils, right? And so when they're different parts, but it's all part of that, that brainstem cerebellar tonsil area, it can dip down because of the weakness there. And so, uh, you know, I think that these guys were one of the first groups to really study that science, use this imaging in a way that they could they could diagnose and, and make uh, you know treatment decisions better. Um, and uh, and this is an emerging science. So if you or someone you know out there is is suffering or struggling with head and neck traumas and injuries, having an upright MRI, having digital motion X-ray, having cone beam CT, having X-rays of the neck to see where the bones are at and how things are, are sitting is really important uh, to help decide how to move forward. Got it. You know, it, it'd be interesting to see too, because there's two, it seems like there's potentially two factors that could be at least the evidence we have now, two factors indicating why the tonsils could be lowered. One of them is decreased CSF because of a dural leak that could be corrected, but another one potentially that ligaments and soft tissue holding the brain and making sure it doesn't come down could be torn. So I think, you know, what are your thoughts on some research that could be done, you know, again, in these positions with torn apical ligaments or alar ligaments or these things that could measure the tonsil or level in different positions and finding whether, you know, kind of differentiating which one it could be and why those tonsils are down. What are your thoughts on doing that as research? So what Dr. Rosa has done, and, and I think he's one of the only people that has worked hand in hand with Dr. Ray Damadian 
um, the inventor of the upright MRI. But what he's done is he's developed a collar that goes around the neck that with Dr. Demedian, um, they have developed a collar and a imaging modality for the upright MRIs where they look so minutely. You can't do this with other machines because you can't, one, you can't, so you have to be upright. So that cuts it down to a certain amount. I think there's like 20 of these machines in the country and there's every single machine should be an upright MRI machine in my opinion. And you know we should all really push for upright MRI imaging because any problem that you have in your spine or your body, it's gonna show up in a more gravity gravity um, correct way on an upright MRI, no matter what your problem is. Um, and then what they've done is they've taken this collar, they've developed a collar that looks specifically at the alar ligaments, at the apical ligaments, at the, um, you know, at all the other ligaments that are there, the, uh, the handful of other ligaments that, that make up the glue that holds the upper neck together. And uh, I don't, Honestly, I don't think anyone else is really doing that or has ever done that. Um, and I think it's quite hard to do and you need very specific imaging for it. So I think that, that, that to answer your question, Kevin, I think that that's actually quite hard to do and you need specific protocols and specific um, tools to do that. Um, because a, a motion x-ray doesn't really, a motion x-ray shows you the bones, but it doesn't show you the ligaments. You can guess what ligaments might be injured, but you can't see which bones. Uh, or you can't. You can guess which bones might be injured, but you can't see which ligaments. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, if patients, uh, doctors, chiropractors, anybody, um, if they feel like they might have some of these symptoms and they feel like maybe they're getting help or you know, whether they want to see an upper cervical chiropractor, whether they want to get an MRI, upright MRI, do you have some sort of list or like how can someone find how can what's the pathway of someone being suspicious that this might be a problem and go into finding out if it's a problem lists of different you know companies around the uh, the united states that have these upright mris and medical doctors that might be able to uh, to see this and upper cervical chiropr and chiropractors in general that might be able to see this? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and there used to be, if you look up, if you type in upright MRI, um, all these centers will pop up. Um, you need to call them, you need to ask them, do you have an upright MRI? Um, and it's not just Fonar centers. Uh, some of the centers uh, for diagnostic imaging, CDI, they have one. So down in Renton, Washington, close to where you're at. Um, that's the only one in Seattle that I'm aware of. Uh, the closest one to us is Yonkers, New York. It used to be in um, uh, out in Albany, but it's gone now. Um, so they're rare. There's really only like, I think there's like less than 20, but there used to be a, a website. I tried to find it a second ago. I typed in Upright MRI Finder, um, but there, if you look, you might be able to find Upright MRI Locator um, and there, there used to be a website that you could find MRI, upright MRIs for all the, way, all the way around the country, wherever they were at. The other website to go to is phonar.com. And that is the uh, originator um, of the upright MRI center. And that is uh, Dr. Ray Demadian's company. So you can go there and if you, can, if you call them, they might have uh, like a locator for you. I think their phone number, their phone number is on their website somewhere. So you just have to look it up. Um, but, uh, but that would be a good way to do that. Got it. Um, now, so in regards to, I mean, the work that we do with upper cervical, we feel like we could potentially help these patients. I mean, if they have a dural leak, that's, that's another thing, but does Dr. Rosa, I know he's done a lot of research with cerebral spinal fluid flow and all these, you know, the upright MRI, does he have any research looking at pre and post? He already read that the title the of that book one more time. Syndrome and MRI. Uh, in this book, it has pre and post images of changes of levels of, of tonsils. 
It also has changes in, he does, they do with Dr. Zamadian and Fonar, they've done video MRI, so MRI over time. Um, and, and what they do is they've actually watched been able to finally watch the CSF flow around the body with the heart, with the heartbeat and the and the, the breathing, and they can actually see it get stuck in places and have eddies and swirls, and that's where that's where we start to develop problems because of those tonsils being stuck, right? And so he's got videos of pre and post. They've got, uh, I believe it's, I believe it's sonar. Um, it's in the it's in this book um, where Dr. Demadian did pre and post sonars of the 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 pinging or the banging of the CSF uh, in, around in the skull, and it calms after an upper cervical correction, and these tonsils go back more into their normal original place uh, after an upper cervical correction. And I'm sure that you're seeing patients that they may not even know that they have uh, you know some tonsillar issues, uh, but they have you know, concussions and they have whiplash and uh, they've just never had it imaged properly, right? Same right. as me, same as all the other upper cervical chiropractors across the country, so. We're just yeah. not doing the imaging to show the pre and post, but it could be potentially there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, is there anything else you want to discuss or, or comment about in regards to this research, about the researchers, how this is a problem, how this can help people, anything else to let people know in regards to this that could help them out? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important for people to understand when you have, have a car accident, we have seen over and over and over again that low speed car accidents, and I know you've seen this too, Kevin, Dr. Leach, I know you've seen this too, that low speed car accidents can cause trauma just as much as high speed. Obviously, high speed accidents are gonna, you know, sprain and tear loose connective tissue. But we see this in low speed, you know, 10 miles an hour and under. Um, it's 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 traumatic to the brain and the neck. And this imaging and some of the other ones that we talked about, digital motion X-ray, can show that. So if you've had if you've had a car accident, it's important that you get your neck checked because if you don't, 10 years down the road, and I don't know about you, but I see this often. Yeah, I had a car accident. It wasn't too bad. Oh, yeah, how long ago? 10 years ago. Okay. Um, what happened? Oh, the car rolled over. No big deal. You know, yeah. I see it all the time, right? Yeah. That matters. The, the type of accident matters the direction your head was if your head is turned in a whiplash accident your head and neck are not meant to do this if you do this in a car accident you are i don't know the percentages but it is it is more likely that you are yeah. going to have trauma to the ligaments the tendons the muscles uh, so it's very important that when you get into a car accident if you have a head and neck trauma injury you know, in sports, whatever, go get imaging, go see an upper cervical chiropractor, see someone to investigate and get you back on track because you may not even know it, but there right. might be an underlying problem that 10 years from now is going to develop into something much worse. And it's important to take care of that when you can. I agree. And I think another point to emphasize is that many people after an accident, number one, they might just shrug it off Maybe they're a tough guy and, oh, I'm not going to go get imaging. And they end up being okay in the sense of they don't, they didn't have a brain bleed or anything severe that killed them. But some people do go get checked out by the medical profession. They'll do an MRI, they'll do CT, whatever's indicated. They won't find a brain bleed. They won't find anything seriously life-threatening. So they get released. And we're very thankful for them to do that. However, if they have a more of a mild injury that could still create issues and problems and health issues then and for the rest of their life, that's when they need to be checked out by an upper cervical chiropractor or someone who, who knows about this, who understands uh, concussion, post-concussion protocol, and to find, you know, to find answers when these symptoms don't go away after the general seven to 14 day, you know, concussion period, 
there's plenty of more to do. So anybody listening, if you went to get checked by the hospital, by the urgent care, and you checked out and you're still having problems long after, this is something you definitely need to investigate. Um, this is going to be on my YouTube channel, on Dr. Evans's YouTube channel. Throw a comment down. Let us know where you are. We'll try to find you somebody if you can't find anybody. Uh, but this is there's a there's a pathway of care that needs to be taken in order for you to get the corrective care that you need in order to heal from these from these injuries. And like like Dr. Evans just said, these these low speed accidents. Uh, can can really cause damage for a lot of people and people you know people might say oh there's no damage to the car so how can there be damage to the patient well there's absolutely damage and there's plenty of research that has shown that so uh, definitely uh, reach out and get some answers if you need it uh, and if you're if you're a medical provider or some other provider and you want you know to to find a chiropractor uh, that deals with the upper neck, the upper cervical spine like we do, by all means, leave a comment, get in touch with us. Our contact information will be uh, below um, and available uh, for those on YouTube. Uh, for the podcast, we'll try to make that available as well. Anything else? That's all. Awesome. Well, Dr. Evans, thank you so much for your time, and we'll do this again in a couple weeks. Thank you, Dr. Leach. Awesome. Thanks, Doc.